Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Uh, I know it's been a long time, and I apologize it's taken so long for me to update this. Uh, I could give you a bunch of explanation, but you probably don't care. Let's just get into it, and let's talk about Stoic Ethics, finally. So I actually just tried to record this video like 20 minutes ago, and my stupid Mac locked up, so let's <laughs> try to get through this. Um, anyway, uh, I really appreciate you coming back and watching this one, especially after such a gap. So we've talked about Stoic physics, and we've talked about Stoic logic, and we've introduced you to some of the great Stoic thinkers. So today, when we talk about ethics, we're gonna kind of wrap up this little series. Um, the fundamental principle in Stoic ethics is probably not what you'd expect. It is, in a word, selfishness. Now, um, that might be surprising to you. Uh, and it's, it's a little, I'm being a little cheeky, but not by much. Stoicism is a self-oriented philosophy. According to Stoicism, the fundamental principle of all life is what they call oikiosis. And that's a hard word to translate. It means something like making oneself at home in the world or homesteading. Um, another way to put it is that all creatures, human beings among them, most fundamentally seek their own good as they understand it to be in the world. Um, the Stoics were eudaimonists, which is to say that they saw the ultimate goal as happiness. Uh, and not just momentary happiness or pleasure, but supreme blessedness, flourishing, abundant joy. Eudaimonia means something like um, uh, the, the good or blessed mind or spirit. Now this was the goal of all of the ancient schools of Greek philosophy. They differ in how they characterize happiness and in what practices and disciplines they recommend to achieve happiness, but they're all oriented towards procuring the same state. So everything you do, to some extent, or, or everything you attempt, successful or not, is to achieve happiness, either now or, or at some future time. So the, the question of the purpose of life for traditional Stoicism is actually fairly straightforward. It's happiness. The question is, what makes real, lasting happiness? And the Stoics have an answer for that too. Audite, excellence. So for the Stoics, happiness is a disposition of your character. Yeah, it's an emotion, sure, but the presence of that emotion is due to a particular state of being, which the Stoics called adite, which following the Latin is often translated as virtue. And that is the right word, but only in the ancient Roman sense, not in the modern sense. And this, this can cause confusion uh, due to the influence of Christianity in the West and Christendom's adoption of the classic virtues. Um, we've come to understand virtue as a kind of abstinence or restraint. And in Latin, the word virtue has the root of vir, meaning man. And so virtue for the Romans is much closer to something like manliness, only without a sense of crudity or, or essential power, inner power, more than sort of an, uh, a negative sense of an absence of sin or something like that. Uh, so today, most scholars will translate erite as excellence, but you will still, still sometimes encounter the word virtue being used. Um, now, if you think back to my video on Stoic physics, uh, I used a metaphor to describe the Stoic conception of the soul, that of a cylinder rolling down a hill. Uh, the dings and the dents of the cylinder create a unique shape, which is the character of the soul, and the rolling downhill is the journey through life, and as the cylinder rolls, it encounters an obstacle or a bump of some sort, and depending on the layout of the cylinder and the dents and the dings, different cylinders are going to react differently. Some are going to fly one way and others another way, and so erite or excellence would be shaping the cylinder in such a way that it automatically moves in the correct manner when it encounters an obstacle. It, it writes itself or it flies true. I know I'm straining this metaphor here a little bit, but if you think about this ability to self-correct, 
as due to the state of the cylinder, that it's well formed, it's well made, you can begin perhaps to grasp how the idea of excellence of character leads to happiness for the Stoics. Um, Epictetus references the simple fact that when we reach our goals, uh, when we achieve what we set out to achieve, we're happy, and when we fail at something, we're unhappy. Uh, but you can only hope to achieve success at something where success lies within your power. Uh, it's pointless to try to succeed at, for example, stopping the sun from rising tomorrow, or hoping that if you just play the odds right, you'll win the state lottery. Uh, some things are up to us, and some things are not up to us. And those things are not up to us. So if you want to be happy, you should aim at the things that are up to you. Um, what are they? Well, according to the Stoics, they are primarily three things. Primarily our judgments about things, which are always up to us. Um, our desires to the extent that we choose to indulge in them or not. And our impulses to action or inaction to the extent that we choose to follow them. And it's on these three categories of things that we should focus as Stoics. These are sometimes referred to as internals. And the things that are not up to us are, well, externals. Now, externals aren't bad, per se. Um, it's not that they don't have value or they're not worth having. Uh, but the problem is that their, their final disposition is not something under our control. So if you set your heart on, on wealth or, 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 or great athletic ability or health or what have you, you're only setting yourself up for disappointment. Epictetus is brutal on this point. Um, at several places in his lectures, he calls his students slaves because in their desire for externals, they are willing to enslave themselves to any person or institution that promises that it can give them what they want. Um, now, this is actually kind of funny if you know that Epictetus was himself a slave before gaining his freedom and becoming a Stoic teacher. And his students, uh, later in life, were mostly the sons of well-to-do Roman families, patricians. So him yelling at them and calling them slaves is, is kind of amusing, but that's beside the point. Um, the point at hand is how should we, we place our focus and, and how should we judge the value of externals, things like health, wealth, fame, and so on. Now, this is a, a critical one in Stoicism, and the Stoic answer is surprisingly sophisticated. Uh, in order to talk about the value of externals, it might be helpful to frame Stoicism in contrast to two more or less contemporaneous schools, the Peripatetics, best known for their famous founder Aristotle, and the Cynics, who were founded by Diogenes. Aristotle wrote that in order to be truly happy, a man needs a certain degree of what the Stoics call externals. Um, you need enough wealth, enough honor. They didn't think that these things were the end-all and be-all of human flourishing, uh, but they were necessary, just not sufficient for happiness. Uh, for the cynics, they take the opposite extreme. For them, the externals have no value. They're distractions, and any valuing of them, valuing of them, excuse me, in any sense, is an error. Now, some Stoics historically leaned more towards the Cynic position, and some leaned more towards the Aristotelian position, but officially, and for the majority of Stoics, they carved out uh, an intellectual position somewhere between these two extremes. So they held that externals do have value because we can use them for human flourishing. Uh, but in and of themselves, they're neutral. Um, Remember that this makes more sense if you think about the, the Stoics saw social human social existence as part of nature. Uh, man is a social animal. We're all embedded in this human fabric, uh, which places certain duties and responsibilities on us. Uh, but for the Stoics, these duties are more than just you know laborious obligations. For the Stoics, nature is divine, and because the world is divine. Our role in the world, our place in it, is a kind of sacred calling. Uh, the Stoics employ metaphors like sailors on a voyage or soldiers stationed at a post. So duty for them isn't just some kind of drudgery. It's like a, a, a challenge put before us by Zeus, that is to say God. Uh, and we need to utilize externals in our duties as men. So it's good to have externals. We would call the state of having the externals that we like preferred and of lacking them non-preferred. Um, but in both cases, it's not really up to us in the final analysis 
uh, how the disposition of externals uh, will fall. Um, so in our relationship with externals and with our duties in society, the Stoics recommended a practice of acting with reservation. We, we set ourselves out to do what we need to do, uh, both for our lives and for our duties, but always keeping in mind that ultimately our goal is to act according to reason and according to nature and to refine our own character and to let the chips fall where they may. Um, action itself is for the Stoics uh, a kind of refining process. It, it allows us to hammer and iron out those dents and dings in our soul so that we can fly true and be happy. And so while the Stoics reject all the actions we would commonly consider wrong in our culture, murder, assault, theft, that kind of thing, the Stoics actually are early critics of slavery. Um, they're one of the first intellectual schools that actually, uh, that, 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 that comes out against it in the, the ancient world. Um, but Stoicism isn't about necessarily a, a laundry list of thou shalts and thou shalt nots. Rather, they analyze all actions according to um, certain very broad categories. So all, all actions which are according to nature, that is, stem from our natural pursuit uh, of indifference, um, are called appropriate. Uh, now, keep in mind, social relations are part of nature for the Stoics. So while human um, sexuality, if you will, is natural, uh, the Stoics expected that this would be bound up within the social institution of marriage. Um, this isn't an endorsement of giving into animalistic impulses, but the Stoics also felt that non-human animals can also engage in appropriate actions. If, if a wolf acts in a way in keeping with its nature, it's acting appropriately. Uh, but these aren't necessarily good. Good actions or correct actions are called katarthoma in Greek, and these are, are completely correct. These are actions that are not only in keeping with our nature, but are also rationally pursued for the apprehension of virtue. Or, in another word, in another sense, audite, excellence, the perfection of our character, which once again is happiness. Or eudaimonia, a blessed spirit or mind, which is attained by attending to our judgments, desires, and impulses. So, there is a kind of gap here, a lacuna, a space, and failure to address this can lead to the false impression that Stoicism is just about repression and control, a tamping down or resisting of impulse, of our baser impulses. Because we haven't established yet any positive character to Erte. We've only defined it by a kind of self-possession or restraint. And it's here that the religious or spiritual, if you prefer, worldview of the ancient Stoics becomes so important because the perfection of one's character in Stoicism is a direct product of their view of man placed within the sacredness of the cosmos. And for more on that, you'll need to refer to my video on Stoic physics. Um, modern Stoicism has done away with Stoic physics and the pantheistic view, or panentheistic view, if you prefer, of the cosmos. And it's tried to hold on to Stoic ethical practices without that, but I don't think you can do that. Not necessarily that you have to accept every aspect of the ancient Stoic worldview, but the fundamental idea of a divine and providential cosmos is the, the foundation of everything else. Uh, I said early on that Stoicism is all tightly bound together. Physics, ethics, and logic all form a whole. Um, and remember that the whole aim here, and indeed of, of all the ancient schools, is the attainment of eudaimonia. And you can't just, you can't be happy just resisting your impulses and telling yourself that you shouldn't worry that, you know, your car got repossessed because it's just an external. That's not going to work. So the, the, the attitude of the Stoic is frequently described as amor fati, or love of fate. The Stoic sage doesn't just accept what happens, he welcomes it as part of the play of the whole, which is divine. Because for the Stoics, nature and God and self are all intertwined. 
to, to sort of grasp this viewpoint, I've pulled some quotes from Epictetus that I'd like to share with you. Um, these are from the Discourses, and I'm just going to kind of read them off in no particular order. If I were a nightingale, I would perform the work of a nightingale. And if I were a swan, that of a swan. But as it is, I am a rational being. And so I must sing the praises of God. This is my work, and I accomplish it, and I will never abandon my post for as long as it is granted to me to remain in it, and I invite all of you to join me in the same song. Uh, in your social relationships, in your physical exercises, in your conversations, aren't you aware that it is a God whom you are feeding, a God whom you are exercising? You carry God around with you, poor wretch, and yet have no knowledge of it. The philosophers say that the first thing that needs to be learned is the following, that there is a God, and a God who exercises providential care for the universe, and that it is impossible to conceal from him not only our actions, but even our thoughts and intentions. The next thing to be considered is what the gods are like, for whatever they're discovered to be, one who wishes to please and obey them must try to resemble them as far as possible. There is one path alone that leads to happiness, and keep this thought at hand, morning, night, and noon. It is to renounce any claim to anything that lies outside the sphere of choice, to regard nothing as being your own, to surrender everything to the deity, to fortune, to consign the administration of everything to those whom Zeus himself has appointed to carry out that task, and to devote yourself to one thing alone, that which is your own. If only one could be properly convinced of this truth, that we're all first and foremost children of God, and that God is the father of both human beings and gods, I think one would never harbor any mean or ignoble thought about oneself. Why, if Caesar were to adopt you, no one would be able to endure your conceit. So if you know that you're a son of God, won't you be filled with pride? God has assigned to each of us as an overseer his own personal guardian spirit and has entrusted each of us to its protection, protection as a guardian that never sleeps and is never open to deception. To what other guardian would he have entrusted us that would have been better and more vigilant than this? And so when you close your doors and create darkness within, remember never to say that you're on your own, for in fact you are not alone because God is with you and your guardian spirit too. And what need do they have of light to see what you're doing? On every occasion, we ought to have these thoughts at hand. Lead me, Zeus, and thou, O destiny, to wheresoever your decrees have assigned me. I will follow cheerfully, or if my will should fail, base though I be, I must follow still. Now, I could go on with more of those, and I could pull from additional Stoic teachers and practitioners, but I, I think you get the idea. It's this attitude of grateful reverence and joy in existence that constitutes the proper attitude for the Stoic, not a stony-faced, sourpussed indifference. That is a caricature of the true Stoic. Now, this view of the world as divine and guided by providence raises a problem for Stoics, and that is the problem of evil or what the Christian apologetics would call uh, theodicy, uh, theodike, uh, God's justice, or a defense of God's justice. This is an attempt to answer the age-old question, why do bad things happen to good people? Or um, how could God allow, insert horrible tragedy here, to happen? So what's the Stoic response? Well, First, we have to be careful what we mean by evil. For, for the Stoics, again, loss of externals, accidents, those kinds of things aren't evil. Uh, they might be bad, non-preferred, and we might personally dislike them or even hate that they happened, but they aren't moral issues. The Stoic God doesn't stand above the world as some kind of divine author that can ex nihilo from nothing, just arrange events however he, she, or it pleases at any given moment. Remember, the Stoic God is embedded in the world. God is the active, intelligent force in the world. And so while God can perhaps attempt to arrange things in the best possible way, and does, 
Um, the sense of universal omnipotence that you find in the Abrahamic faiths isn't really a thing in Stoicism. Um, it, one way to think about this sort of embodied God is to think about your, your own body. So you are also a, a spirit embodied, and you have control over your body, more or less. You know, you can move your hands around, but you're, you're, and you can try to take the best care of yourself possible. If you're, if you're a, a truly virtuous person pursuing excellence, you're going to try to maintain yourself as best you can. Um, but there's certain things that I can't do. So, for example, I can't touch my left ear with my right ankle. My body just doesn't bend that way. For me to exist in the world and to do things, I have to have a certain structure. And and while I can go to the gym and work out and modify that structure and eat right, th the structure also limits me. It imposes certain limitations on me. And and so that's a trade-off that has to be made for the greater good of human existence. Um, uh, you know, likewise, if you want to enjoy eating food, you have to also sometimes use the bathroom. And you know, if you're exposed to carcinogens, you, you might get cancer. And if, and if you want to enjoy the beauty and excitement of youth, well, guess what? You also get to experience the trials and tribulations of old age. For the Stoics, these aren't evil. They're just part of existence. Um, so it's not a, a problem for Stoicism that they exist. Uh, but Stoicism does recognize wrongdoing and evil. It, it's just explicitly a human problem. Um, because we have uh, logic, uh, thinking, a reasoning mind, God or the universe isn't responsible for our judgments, our opinions, uh, how we react to our desires or impulses. As reasoning beings, beings with this logic, those things are up to us. And if we give in to those uh, non-unvirtuous opinions and impulses, then we beget evil. Um, the first and the main person we're going to beget evil upon uh, is ourselves. We're going to hurt ourselves because when we when we we give in to to incorrect uh, views of the world um, and we we reject its divine nature and we choose what we know to be wrong, we deform our soul and we make ourselves unhappy. Uh, the, the Stoic uh, argument against evil isn't necessarily ne that you're going to be punished for it necessarily, but that you are punishing yourself by doing it. Um, the question of free will comes up a lot among newer students of Stoicism, and they don't spend a lot of time fretting about this. Personally, for me, the debate about free will doesn't have a whole lot of traction. I think it's kind of a silly thing to worry about. But but if you need to address it, uh, um, I, I always come back to the words of a, of a mentor of mine, Chris Fisher, who said something to the effect of, we may or may not have free will, but we always have free won't. In other words, you may not always be able to choose the right thing, but you can always choose to stop a bad thing from getting worse even if the limit of your ability is to bear suffering with dignity and refuse to turn against the fundamental goodness of existence and the cosmos. That is still virtuous, and in some cases, I would even say that is heroic. Um, so there isn't really a concept of cosmic guilt in Stoicism. Committing evil acts deforms rather one's character, and it makes happiness harder to attain. Uh, the Stoics did accept that there was some kind of afterlife experience. They seemed to hold to a more, more or less conventional Greco-pagan view on that, but they don't stress it a whole lot. And, uh, and some Stoics, like Marcus Aurelius, entertain even the idea that maybe there isn't. Um, but either way, he still holds to the Stoic view. Uh, to go full circle here, Remember that Stoic morality is focused on your happiness or unhappiness here and now and in this life. Whew. Well, that's a lot of stuff. I think I've rambled on this topic long enough. Uh, before I close out this video, I'd like to say something about a shift in direction, at least temporarily for this channel. I know I've been devoted to Stoicism for the first few months here, and I would like to continue to talk about philosophy, both Stoic and non-Stoic, classic and modern, in the future. 
but I've also got other stuff I'd like to do. And one of the things that I've committed to doing is a comic book uh, with my very good friend and artist, uh, John Torres. So for the next couple of weeks or months, I'm going to be sharing my comic writing process with you guys. I'm going to be talking about the plot and the narrative, and I'm also going to talk about trying to set up funding and publishing because I don't know anything about that. So we're going to learn all that together. Um, I know that's a big shift, uh, but I, I hope you'll see how it all comes together. I'm, I'm at heart a philosopher in the original sense, a lover of wisdom, and like some of my heroes, Seneca and Plato, I, I want to try to marry philosophy and literature and the arts. And I hope you'll join me on that adventure. I'm going to try to develop some of the themes we've talked about here in the narrative of the comic. So if you came here for philosophy, I hope, even though I'm gonna be talking about co a comic book, I hope we're still gonna scratch that itch. If you have questions, please keep sending them to me. And I know some of you sent questions already. Uh, maybe I'll try to do like a Q&A show where I address all of them before we sort of officially close out the stoicism topic. Um, I'll also try my best not to let so much time go between updates. Uh, I've updated some of my social media links. I'll put that below in the comments so you can follow me on Parler or Twitter as long as I'm still there or whatever if you want to chat. Um, anyway, uh, to close out this short introductory series on Stoicism, I'd like to share with you a Stoic mnemonic, a memory device, uh, that I wrote. It's a little poem and it's in traditional hexameter. All beings chase their own good, will rising from our judgment, judgments of all things in the world, our success and failures. Happiness is our choice, virtue ever close at hand, Mind is always up to us, and with it, our emotions. To live in harmony with all of sacred nature means first and most of all, being joyous in yourself, for excellence of action, regardless of outcome, and steadiness of soul lie always in your power. Anyway, thank you for watching. See you next time.